everyone and good morning to the entire EHI Virtual Health Summit, Equity Summit. And welcome to the first panel, uh, the first panel of the conference, which is all around advancing digital health equity for rural and underserved populations. My name is Chad Dodd, Vice President for Product Management at Athena Health. And it's a tremendous pleasure to be here and also be joined by a, a great panel that is gonna introduce themselves in just a few minutes. At Athena Health, we have a mission and really truly a journey to create a thriving ecosystem that delivers accessible, high quality and sustainable healthcare for all. At Athena, we believe that equity is not purely the result of our work, but rather a principle for how we work and of the work itself. This means going beyond just simply having the intention to do good things, but to employing the value of equity in everything that we do. There are many factors that impact health equity, such as policy, history, funding, community, neighborhoods, individuals, and to complicate the matter, these factors are also very interrelated. And no one knows this challenge more than FQHCs, who are on the front lines of providing care for rural and underserved populations across the country. We support over 10,000 providers in FQHCs who are doing amazing work in their communities to provide care, to provide equitable care for all in their communities. And they're doing just amazing, innovative ideas to outreach and bridge the gap. Today in this panel, we're gonna focus our discussion on, discussion on bridging the gap to health equity and the problems that persist in leveling access to quality of care for all. And I'm excited to be joined by a great panel of experts who are here to really talk through and, and walk and discuss uh, the innovations, the opportunities, the capabilities and the things they're doing to really bridge that gap itself. So I'm joined, let me introduce the panel and then I'll let them speak and introduce themselves and their organizations and, and then we'll dive into uh, a few questions that we have and discussion topics and then open it up to a discussion and questions from the audience themselves. But I'm excited to introduce Diego, who is the Chief Quality Officer at Borican Health in, in Miami, Florida, as well as I'm joined by Chris Grasso, who is the Associate Vice President for Informatics and Data Services at Fenway Health in Boston. And I'm joined by Jessica Jones, Quality and Value-Based Care Programs Director at North Country Health in New York. So to get started, Diego, do you wanna introduce yourself and your organization and some of the exciting things that you have uh, going on? Uh, so uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, um, uh, my name is Diego Schmules. I'm the Chief Quality Officer at Borinquen. Medical Centers over in Miami-Dade County. Um, my background is a uh, family physician by trade. Um, I'm a board certified in healthcare quality management uh, with a master's in public health. Um, and I've been a Barinkin for over 11 years. I was brought on board to implement our quality department. Uh, so it's been uh, quite a journey. Barinkin is a federally qualified healthcare center. Uh, it was created in 1972 um, in the heart of Wynwood. So for some people that come to Miami now, it's a trendy place, but that's not what it was before. Uh, we are located also in nine different locations throughout Miami-Dade County. And um, one, of the, one of the things that Borinkin has done is expanding services. We served last year over 34,000 patients uh, on, all, uh, on all types of care from uh, adult medicine, uh, pediatric, psychiatry, um, specialty HIV, obstetrics, GYN. Um, and before COVID, we served uh, 45,000 patients. So obviously we've been hit with COVID in terms of the patient population that was able to access care. So that's gonna talk a lot about health inequities, right? Um, uh, we actually are, um, we're one of the top uh, uh, quality award receivers um, in, in the FQHC world. We've been doing it in a way to try to provide and, and, and level the playing field for healthcare uh, inequality as we serve, uh, you know, uh, a, a very diverse population. Um, and so I think that uh, now, as we are the primary uh, source of infection for HIV in the United States, uh, we had to be number one some way, somehow, right? 
Uh, now it's also part of the health inequity and what we have to deal with and struggle on a day-to-day -day basis as well. So um, I think we will be talking more about health inequity and, and I know there's some questions that we can answer uh, as we go about, but I just wanted to you know, give a little bit of a picture of where we are. And even though it's a nice fancy place, our communities you know, suffer a lot. Great, thanks very much, Diego. And thanks for joining us. Uh, Chris, you wanna kick us off and introduce yourself and Fenway Health and uh, some of the exciting things you have going on. Great, thank, thanks so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chad. And thank you to the summit for inviting me to participate in this really important uh, topic today. Um, as Chad said, I'm Chris Grasso from Fenway Health in Boston. Uh, um, we are an FQHC. We were founded in 1971, so uh, celebrating our 50th year this year. Uh, and really, our mission has, has been, and, and even more recently, uh, been about providing innovative and equitable, uh, accessible healthcare entry points, um, and particularly for those communities who are um, often underserved or marginalized, like the LGBTQI community and the BIPOC community. So, really looking for different ways that we can. Um, uh, approach this as that no wrong door model and ways that we can offer services and entry points for people to care. Uh, we serve about, uh, care for about 35,000 patients annually. Um, and prior to COVID, we saw patients come from about a thousand zip codes, but we certainly saw that expand during the pandemic, which we'll kind of talk about a little bit more today. Um, um, in addition to our primary care and medical care, uh, behavioral health care, optometry, vision services that we offer at Fenway, we also have the Fenway Institute that offers uh, research, education, and where a lot of our policy work happens as well. Um, and additionally, we also have public health programs which offer drug user health assistance, uh, housing support. We also offer uh, more um, you know, on-site and accessible uh, STI and HIV treatment from there. And Catherine, if you're able to slip up to the next slide, you know, one of the things I wanted to really kind of talk about and we're gonna get into more today is really what we saw sort of happen as a result of the pandemic. And, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, we saw patients really coming from probably about a thousand zip codes prior to the pandemic. So we really serve patients from, you know, all, all across New England. And because of the specialty care that we provide around LGBTQIA health uh, plus HIV, you know, we saw patients travel from a far distance. But, um, you know, once the pandemic hit and we saw uh, a, a relaxing of the regulations and uh, reimbursement parity, we started to sort of see this phenomenon happening where we started to see patients actually uh, access our services from using telehealth from all over the country. Um, and we've had patients come from about 40 states uh, during that period of time. Some of these were patients who maybe lived in the area and moved somewhere else, uh, but many of these were new patients. And, you know, the, the critical kind of point here is that really for the first time, I think for many people, they were able to access physicians uh, who were trained, you know, to provide culturally responsive care, who really understood their needs, who, you know, the patient didn't have to educate the provider on what their needs were. And so, you know, this is where I think it's so important where, you know, digital health and technology really can uh, really make uh, major strides and, and really provide access points for, uh, you know, many of these com communities who are um, often underserved and marginalized. And, um, and uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Chad. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, and uh, Jessica, you want to introduce yourself and North Country and uh, what and some of the great things you guys are doing? Sure, welcome. Um, so my name is Jessica Jones. I'm the Quality and Value Based Programs Director at North Country Family Health Center. Um, just like Fenway, we're also celebrating our 50th year serving our community um, here in 2021. With the past decade as a federally qualified health center and then CQA recognized patient centered medical home. Um, we're a bit smaller than my colleagues here. We serve about 11,500 patients a year for family, medical, dental, and behavioral health services. Um, including substance abuse treatment at our four community-based locations covering two counties in the very northern New York, almost to Canada uh, region. Uh, we also have some school-based medical, dental, and behavioral health services in a few of our local districts, um, and then also some temporary school-based sites that provide dental services. Uh, we also operate a program called Healthcare for All, which um, connects individuals who are experiencing homelessness or housing instability uh, with housing resources and ensures that they um, can engage in primary care services. Um, we also have a pregnancy program that serves high risk pregnant and parenting families um, to ensure that they have support, education and assistance um, with basic needs 
so they can focus on their overall health and the health of their babies. Um, our health center also operates the two uh, WIC programs in our uh, main county and, and surrounding county as well. Um, we have insurance enrollers, uh, and during the pandemic, we certainly partnered with our community, public health, and school districts, even some public housing facilities to offer uh, COVID vaccinations, um, including in-home vaccination services and daily testing for our community. Um, being from a very rural area, a lot of our challenges uh, surround transportation. Um, we do have some local uh, transportation providers, but they're experiencing difficulties in hiring just like many of us are, uh, restrictions on how far they can travel. Um, we do not have a countywide transportation system in our main county here. Um, so we have adapted to purchase uh, over the past year, three vehicles that we're able to use to transport patients or bring services directly to them. Um, we also have patients that have some data issues or device issues um, in terms of connecting via telehealth services. So um, we have made some adaptations to support patients by providing devices and data plans uh, to be able to continue to connect them to primary care services. Um, and, you know, being rural, we do have a lot of issues with connecting uh, with specialist offices. We don't have a lot of specialists in our local area, so patients do need to travel uh, quite a distance to get to them. Um, and we've we've made some ad adaptations there. Um, so, yeah. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Jessica, and thanks so much for, for joining us here. So we have a, a tremendous panel with broad views and challenges that they have in their communities that they're working through to really bridge the gap of health equity. And we know that health equity occurs across a broad range of dimensions. Uh, it could be socioeconomic status, age, geography, language, gender, disability, citizenship, sexual identity, orientation. Um, I wonder if each of you could, could highlight and talk a little bit about how does your organization look at healthcare inequalities? And how do you measure that? And, and how do you look at your success? I don't know, Diego, do you wanna, you wanna kick us off? All right, thank you for uh, making me the first volunteer. <laughs> um, so obviously um, uh, the, the way we look at healthcare inequalities is uh, a twofold. One, uh, on a yearly basis as an FQHC, we have to prepare a work plan, right? And as we look at our UDS data um, and we have to meet certain standards, um, we always look back at what, what held the patient population back in achieving certain goals and certain measures, right? Uh, from controlling blood pressure, uh, from, you know, from managing obesity, from managing you know, smoke cessation or substance use disorders. Um, and, and so, uh, we basically look at our core quality measures and we look at social determinants of health and we say, and we try, we try, we try to mix and match uh, what could have happened to certain populations that we currently know that they're having, you know, a higher uh, um, gap in care. Um, uh, our challenges will differ. Uh, and as I mentioned in Miami, we have, 10 different locations, our, our, our challenges will differ from the Hispanic population, uh, then from the uh, Haitian speaking population, right? Uh, we noticed that the cultural disadvantage on the Haitian speaking population, it's high, it's big, it's, it's, there's a big gap. Uh, most of them come with their, with their uh, children who speak English so they won't tell you everything, right? And that, de that decreases our ability to care for them properly. And then with Hispanics, obviously uh, it becomes, uh, unfortunately, it becomes depending on what country they come from. Uh, if it's Caribbean, South America, Latin America, uh, the, 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 the affected community is gonna be different. Uh, we have higher rates of HIV infection in MSM Hispanics uh, that come from the islands in the Caribbean, as well as from the Haitian community than any other community, right? So as we work on that work plan and as we see uh, those health inequalities, uh, what we try to, uh, to measure, um, and, 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 it's, and it's, there's never a right or wrong answer. What we try to measure is uh, what is their digital divide? What is their gap? Uh, because we provide telemedicine. 
And so uh, our, uh, our black population has less access to Wi-Fi. So we know that we can try to get them into telemedicine. So we try to bring them into care. We know that with Hispanics, we try to uh, give them more face-to-face. -face. They like the warm touch of a provider, right? Uh, so uh, we try to measure uh, in terms of, you know, who accesses telemedicine, who has uh, a higher incidence of uh, cultural issues uh, when it comes to diet. Uh, our Black population suffer from more food deserts than the Hispanic population, right? Um, the Hispanics tend to be capable of understanding and changing their, their food to address and manage nutritional issues. While the, the, our Black uh, population, not only they suffer from more uh, uh, food deserts, but also their income is lower. And so they end up eating more McDonald's, more Taco Bell. Um, and obviously that also affects uh, their health. Um, what are we trying? And so what we've been trying to do um, in addition to that is trying to do, do and perform activities that integrate the care. Um, because they have social economic status, they have low health literacy, and sometimes they don't have the time, they gotta work. Uh, we've been creating uh, what we call shared medical appointments and virtual visits. And we have multiple providers providing that kind of care. Uh, so they get to see the nutritionist, they get to see uh, a mental health counselor and they get to see their PCP. And, and we try to address those components that can be discussed in that setting um, and, and re-engage them in care on a, on a, on a regular basis. Uh, we've been able to provide nutritional visits um, and that also has opened up the door in the white space, which is their home. So it uh, also allows us to see social determinants of health. So you can see that sometimes they, they you get to see that they're, uh, there's a, they're living in a small apartment with multiple people, right? Uh, that their kitchen is not the best equipped kitchen, that the refrigerator is packed with, uh, you know, whole milk and not with things that can, you know, serve them better. So, um, so we've, been, we've been trying to assess, uh, in, in summary, we're trying to assess those health inequalities based on the outcomes of those measures and, and the challenges that makes them not perform them. Um, and we compare the populations that we serve. Um, and, uh, and, and that's how we've been trying to do so. Is there a magic uh, uh, data uh, report that we can that we can achieve? I, I don't think uh, Chris, who works in data analysis, has found the magic one either. Um, but what we try to do is try to use uh, the feedback, right, the surveys and their outcomes, and and we've been able to trend out throughout the past the years that uh, we already know that that our Haitians are more complicated than the Hispanics. And that our, that our Latino-based population suffer more from immigration issues than others. So then that's another one that we indirectly measure uh, and we see what can happen. So that's what we've been trying to do um, to try to come up with a plan to deliver healthcare inequalities. Um, and uh, as Chris was mentioning, I think COVID helped us try to push for that management on a virtual space. Uh, but we still have a long way to go uh, to find, you know, proper measures on it. Oh, great, great. Thanks very much, Diego. Uh, Chris or, or Jessica, any, anything to add or from your perspective? Sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, similarly to Diego, you know, we uh, are sort of approaching this from multiple different angles. I think you kind of can't look at this in one particular way. A couple of things that I'll highlight that the work that we're doing at Fenway is, you know, sort of looking at our data, right, and more locally and sort of understanding what, what's happening with our patient population that we're caring for. And, um, you know, oftentimes we're, you know, we get so consumed and, and worried about as healthcare providers, are we meeting our, uh, our you know, quality measures, for example, and we're sort of like, hey, we're 75% cl compliant, right, or 60% compliant, yay, good for us. But what we're not doing is looking at the, those 25% or 30 or 40% of patients who are not compliant. Let's understand who these patients are. Um, let's look at their demographics. So let's understand, like, are we missing a big chunk of our patient population? And 
but also look look at it through an intersectional lens because we know that people don't just operate in solo right so in silo so it's you know we want to understand like particularly for those communities who are maybe have the highest rates of disparities like black transgender transgender and trans feminine women for example you know have highest rates of disparity so how well, how well are we doing at getting them into care so and it's really about looking at the data but it's also flipping the data because oftentimes the way that even the, the way that uh, a lot of software programs sort of spit these data out you know they have the biggest populations at the top you know left hand corner and so when you're looking at it by the time you get to, to the bottom right you're sort of missing some of those some of the smallest populations who have maybe the biggest uh, health outcomes and disparities so i think it's really important to understand like how well you're serving the patients um, that you're caring for uh, who's falling out of care who, who's missing who's not coming back why are they not coming back um, and also like who's not showing up at all. So I think it's like really important to understand what's happening. And if we're really gonna address equity and you know, some of the ways that we think about equity is really about, um, it's really about those processes of removing those, those barriers and obstacles that really prevent people from, from having that fair opportunity to be healthy. And so part of the work that we're doing is um, not just at the local level, but we also feel uh, it's important for us to do a lot of work and advocacy and, and policy change uh, at the federal level as well. And so. Um, we're also in, involved in um, a lot of standards groups like HL7, who's, who's trying to really push the em envelope and, and add some new fields uh, that will allow inter you know, interoperability between systems with you know, names and pronouns to, so that you know, uh, people have opportunity to, to receive more culturally affirming care. But it's also working uh, with lo a lot of vendors like Athena Health, for example. We just participated uh, in the last week with a, a code fest that they did. Uh, to basically design their program to be uh, more inclusive uh, for uh, transgender and gender diverse patients that they're caring for. So these kind of opportunities are really impactful and they don't just impact uh, what happens here at Fenway, but they have the opportunity to impact uh, patients who are getting care at any organizations, for example, around the country. So if anybody's using an Athena Health product, for example, they have the benefit of using you know, these tools that Athena uh, just recently developed through this CodeFest uh, partnership with, with us and a number of their other customers. So, so people have then have the opportunity to learn from us right, and, and use these resources and these tools um, to better provide care. So, um, so it's definitely not a one size fits all. Um, I think in terms of, of health equity, we really, really need to be sort of approaching this from multiple angles. So. Chris, you, you mentioned the data side. I'm sure there's many people in the audience who are, are, are wondering. We know that, as you said, that a lot of the data and the research and you know, clinical decision support and care pathways are defined by the, the larger populations that are there and, and thus missing out on the underserved. Um, as an informatics leader and a thought leader in the industry, how, how do you bridge that gap so that uh, we're, we don't have an unconscious bias to healthcare and to the practice of healthcare based on the data and, and, and the research that's there. Yeah, it's a fantastic question, Chad. And I think this is ex exactly where I think the industry can go. And I think now that we're collecting a lot of these data, we have a lot of these data in um, you know, standard formats now within EHRs, you know, there's a real opportunity to sort of push this forward. Um, so being able to sort of take all these data points, like you know, things related to sexual orientation, gender identity, age, uh, anatomical inventories and actually pull them into um, clinical decision support so that, you know, we're sort of making recommendations to the clinicians in terms of, you know, what a patient is due for. So not moving away from that, like population health level of saying, um, if, you know, if you're a woman, you must have a cervix, so you need a cervical cancer. And this is often how people get missed uh, in terms of having procedures due. So, so we really need to sort of think more about how we can use the technology and harness the data to really support uh, you know, many of the, the care teams on the ground um, in, in terms of doing the, the, that work and really trying to over, overcome those biases and, and, and how the system sort of help and suggest things that the patient might be due for, uh, uh, you know, and, and tailor it to a particular patient's needs. You know, that, that thought around precision medicine, for example, right? Like moving away from population-based work to more for that, what that particular person needs at that point in time. And that was, I mean, that was something that, you know, Diego certainly mentioned is kind of that personalized care, especially across such a diverse population of tailoring care discussion uh, to, to their needs and, and so forth. Uh, Diego, do you want to add something to that? or? Uh, well, actually, what Chris mentioned, I think that the way data from, from the policymakers towards what even managed care programs do is basically provide the positive side of it, right? They don't look on the negative side, which in reality, I, I heard it once from uh, one of my, my, my colleagues when he tried to write a paper and he couldn't find data. And he said, even bad data can be published. 
because that's an error that nobody should make, right? So I think that uh, that to really understand health equity inequality from the perspective of of data, we got to look at the non-compliance piece and 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 look at the exceptions so that they can become the rule to fix our problem, right? If you have a patient that has a condition and is only seeing a psychiatrist and doesn't see their primary care physician, there must be something going on, right? And we should find that about it. And we should train our clinicians to look at that exception and say, what can we do so that that person can also feel comfortable going to the PCP and addressing the other 9,000 things that they might suffer from? So I think that uh, as a community, uh, we should uh, start looking at the negative side of things so that we can turn it around, like Chris said, and, 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 and make sense out of that data that is, that, and we shouldn't say it's hurting us because we as FQHCs, we are dinged by her side. We don't perform well, but I think that it should say that can educate us better, right? That negative uh, outcomes should educate us in what to do better. Uh, well said. I mean, looking at, you know, what's missing, what aren't we seeing and what's wrong and, uh, and tackling those. I, that's great. Jessica, I want to pull you in and, and get your thoughts as to, uh, as, as you're looking at uh, your, your health center, how you guys look at um, health and equity and how you're measuring it, what, what you're doing uh, from, you know, kind of that perspective, that view. Sure. Yeah. So we, um, we do assess patients using the prepare, um, social determinants of health, uh, assessment tool at each new patient visit and annual visit, uh, for our medical patients. Um, we do have this information mapped into our data analytics tool, which, um, provides a, a comprehensive risk stratification algorithm to our entire population. Um, so we do use those social determinants to kind of drive a patient's risk score, um, which can be surfaced at the time of the visit or in pre visit planning services. So this covers medical and behavioral health conditions, um, the number of documented social determinants of health concerns, uh, lab and vital information. Um, and then patients are, are, are grouped into different risk levels. Um, and so for us, I think understanding what conditions our population in the high risk, medium risk, and low risk area are dealing with, the volume of social determinants of health concerns that kind of can come through through analyzing that information is helpful for us to understand where we maybe need to partner with community organizations to support those services or where we as a health center can step in um, to provide that service to individuals individuals. Um, and we also have um, definitely documented issues with um, data access for patients. So as we've tried to try to move into the area of expanding telehealth services, one thing we have a challenge with is uh, patients who don't necessarily have devices or data that uh, supports the use of telehealth in our community. So um, as I mentioned a bit earlier, we have used some grant funding to purchase devices and data plans for patients to allow those with transportation issues, um, especially in the very cold winters of Northern New York, um, to or just physical mobility issues to be able to access primary care services um, and also to be able to use those devices to attend specialist telehealth appointments um, as well. Um, and then just in general, telehealth services with providers, it's difficult to recruit and retain providers in our community. So um, for example, we have contracted with, um, uh, with some psychiatrists uh, where patients can come into our office um, and be able to see, uh, be able to see those providers. So um, for us, we're kind of looking at total population, but I would definitely agree with Chris and Diego about looking at the people that are not met. That's actually a project that we're working on right now with a public health intern is to um, take a set of measures and really dig into the population that's not meeting that quality measure um, and, you know, kind of flip it from, yay, you're doing a great job. And, you know, where, where can we do better? Um, and how can we target that population very specifically? What kind of marketing, um, what kind of outreach? Um, we've even thought about, you know, plotting those individuals on a map. So where are they physically located? Where's their home location? Um, is that a place where we could put an outreach clinic? Is that somewhere that our community health worker could go knock on a few doors in a neighborhood? Um, do we need to partner with community-based organizations? So um, I think that's definitely the direction that we're, that we're thinking about going as well. 
Uh, Jessica, I mean, that's great. And, and a lot of the things you're talking about is a combination of kind of the, the healthcare IT and the digital with kind of the, the human infrastructure element to be able to bridge that gap that's there. Um, I, I know what Athena and Chris mentioned this is we've been on embarking on a journey of providing technology to close those gaps in care. Uh, and, you know, we've done in, in some work around gender affirming care. Uh, and that was the code fest that, that Chris talked about. But I'm interested to hear, Jessica, from your perspective, how can healthcare IT, how can the, the digital world help bridge this gap? And how are you looking at uh, some of the digital initiatives in conjunction with some of the outreach that you're doing? Or what can digital do more to help uh, bridge that gap? Yeah, I think the ability to um, to text patients, not just for reminders or um, or appointment, you know, hey, you're due for this service, but um, communicate with patients via text um, outside of kind of a, appointment scheduling would be very helpful. Um, again, again, we have patients who have phone devices that don't necessarily have minutes, uh, but they can text all of the time. So that's something that um, being able to expand that service um, would be very helpful. I think the implementation of telehealth embedded within the EHR has been very beneficial for us. Um, and maybe allowing that to, um, to expand to not um, be within an appointment, but allow our community health workers, our care coordinators, our, um, our substance abuse service team to be able to connect with patients outside of a scheduled appointment um, to have conversations uh, with them would be beneficial. And I think those tools to kind of help us map patients. So um, it's great if I can get an Excel file of everybody who hasn't met a certain quality measure, but um, it would be helpful if you could plot for me on a map all of the patients who are experiencing food insecurity. So where is that food desert located and how do those patients kind of fit in? Or um, individuals who are high ER utilizers um, with an avoidable, um, you know, diagnosis coming out of that visit. So, um, where are they physically located? Is that a place where we need to, um, could we put an urgent care? Could we put, um, a pop-up clinic a few times a week? So, um, for us, we're really looking at, um, especially cause we have limited resources in a large geographic area is where can we, like, where are they located so that we can, um, put our staff there physically to, um, really start to build that trusting relationship with individuals, um, and kind of learn more more about that, uh, about that community because they're so far spread out. Oh, great. Diego, I, to, to you, uh, similar question, but you, you mentioned kind of this, uh, you have a broad, diverse population and technology seems to be a struggle for some, right? Uh, and many people here are in that technology space. And I, as we think about it, it's kind of the conflict of technology can help, but if it's not accessible, how can it be used to, to leverage that? How do you guys think about, or and how should the broader kind of healthcare IT industry think of using technology to bridge a gap where technology might not be available to uh, those populations? Uh, so, so like I said, depending on the population, um, one of the things we've learned is that as I mentioned, our, our Hispanic population wants the, you know, the warm feel of somebody in the room, right? And as much as they might have access to technology, uh, they might want to go into a clinic. And the, the, uh, our Black Haitian co uh, community has the issue, has the biggest digital divide uh, in our community. Um, whether because they, uh, some of them just have a simple cell phone that has, is not a smartphone, so you, they can't access certain things. Um, so we become a little bit creative in the space of accessing care to patients. So you can do uh, something that we call that, which is a hybrid model that we've been uh, trying to implement uh, slowly as, as uh, certain restrictions and certain uh, rates of infection for COVID has decreased throughout our community, um, which is basically we have a mobile ban, right? And we are providing uh, uh, access to care uh, in the communities, in those communities that we feel that they want, they're not showing up at their appointments, uh, that they be, they're a cluster. And, and we call them a cluster if there's a cluster of HIV, there's a cluster of hypertension, or there's a cluster of diabetes. Uh, we don't go crazy with everything, right? We try to be as simple-minded as possible because uh, there's not enough staff and anybody who's working in FQHC 
wears like 50,000 hats to try to do different, different things. Uh, so because of that, it's, 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 uh, we, we've been trying to do so where we go into the community and we basically have a, a screening model uh, where we have an outreach team that can perform phlebotomy. We have, we have the ability to perform telehealth with either um, the Amwell cart or with the Cure for You app uh, that we that synchronizes with our EHR with Athena Health, um, and so uh, the idea is that the patient can get you know the whole screenings, and if they're abnormal in one of the screenings, high blood pressure, high glucose, uh, HIV positive or STD positive, we can coordinate. Uh, to get them linked uh, to a provider virtually, and they can get access to care in that way, right? Uh, and, and that opens up their ability to see somebody uh, and get treatment and get treated. Uh, and that's, uh, that is something that we started to do uh, currently. And, and as I said, it's a, it's a hybrid model to try to bring in care in the community uh, uh, because of what I said, they don't have a smartphone, um, and uh, I think that my biggest complaints is that policymakers really, they just try to do a lot of policy, but they really don't think of what the community is suffering from. And so in Florida, we have managed care plans that are, are forcing people to do telemedicine with a virtual visit, meaning uh, a face-to-face, -face, FaceTime, uh, video and audio, so you can bill for telemedicine. So that puts a lot of uh, problems with patients who don't have smartphones, right? Um, and then the, the, other, uh, the other hybrid model that we started doing it and it was because of COVID is that um, we have different locations where we have different rooms that are set up so that if the patient walks in and we don't have a clinician there uh, and that patient wants to be seen by a clinician, we can actually you know, trigger the telemedicine and they will be able to see a clinician remotely, but we can draw the labs, we can do the vitals there, we can do everything there. They're just not gonna be seeing the clinician at that point in time. Um, and we are uh, starting to do so and we're planning to do so with our endocrinologist. So she's located in one of the, one of the main sites. And so uh, our patients don't need to go to the main site uh, on a regular basis. They will be able to just initiate a call from another location that they want to attend uh, like a hub uh, they get the virtual visit um, and they get to be seen right and that, that way they also get you know the guidance and the navigation because one of the things that I mentioned earlier is that you know uh, health literacy is very complicated and some people mistrust the system uh, they don't think that they're going to be able to get something done so if you get that kind of combination, currently we're able to uh, minimize that gap that we see in Miami uh, with our patients. Um, we've been getting, you know, we've gotten uh, cell phones and smartphones for uh, patients to use for three months. And if they come and control their blood pressure, they get a smartphone and they can walk away with it. Uh, but we notice that in reality, our patients just basically use the cell phone and they don't use it for the purpose of calling us. They use it to call their, their family members. So because we can't manage that part and that's something that it will take some time, I think that uh, the way we're trying to minimize the impact on that gap that we have in Miami-Dade County uh, has allowed us. And actually, uh, one of the things that, that we are proud is that uh, with COVID, we didn't do bad at our cancer screening rates uh, for Borenkin and our, our chronic disease management rates, you know, kept pretty good, even though uh, we had COVID, right? So it does, it does seem to work. It's not the answer, but it does, you know, support the impact. And it also lets the community know that, you know, we're out there, we're here to help you and, you know, we, we can try right oh that's great great uh great overview i loved it the combination of the technology again the infrastructure the outreach and, and really that personalized approach of meeting patients where they are uh, chris chris to you interested uh a, a couple of things that go along and kind of digital approach uh to to solving some of the equitable problems um you know one is is around 
you know, some of the pain points or the access to technology. But there's another one around distrust of the technology uh, that may be there. And just want to see if you've seen that or, or heard that or as you've expanded your telehealth services uh, around the country and, and what other kind of technology approaches you're, you're using to kind of bridge that gap in equity uh, within your community. Yeah, I mean, I think it's always important to understand where people are coming from and just distrust of whether how their information is going to be used or if it's going to be safe and uh, kept confidential. So I, I think it's important to really do a lot of messaging and educating your patients around, uh, you know, how the equipment can be used in a safe manner. Um, you know, we know that even, for example, um, if somebody has access to telehealth, um, they can't always do it, you know, in their home. Like if there's a uh, if they're not safe in their home, if they're experiencing intimate partner violence, for example, they may, they may not be able to actually even do telehealth from their home. And so um, I think it's, you know, it's important to um, engage in communities. And one way which I've been, you know, really um, wanting our organization to think about and within our organization, how we could do more of this is actually engaging our patients in the process of, of selecting patient-facing software. Because oftentimes so many organizations, you know, will go out and We'll look at a few products and we'll say like, well, this is great. This has lots of bells and whistles. And then we roll it out and we find that it, it's not accessible from, for our patients. And so, um, you know, I think it's, a, it's an area that um, we as, you know, healthcare organizations and as, you know, software vendors can do is, is really to sort of get patients engaged in this process and say, hey, how does this work for you? Do you feel like it's really going to meet your needs? And, and you know, and I think, um, you know, engaging the patients in the process is a key so that we're, you know, making sure that we're not leaving anybody out or leaving anybody behind in that process. And um, I also think like, did it, you know, we think about healthcare literacy, but digital literacy is, is a big piece of this too, right? I mean, um, not everybody feels comfortable using technology. Um, you know, some people, you know, maybe uh, only have, you know, access to an iPhone or Android. And so, whatever uh, applications and, uh, you know, uh, technology we put in place, I mean, it's important to have that accessible, right? So if you only have, uh, you know, uh, uh, telehealth is accessible through an app, that's going to be a problem for somebody, you know, who maybe has a laptop, right? Um, I have to times think about, you know, uh, my father who's in his 80s, uh, he has a PC, but I don't think he's turned on three years, but he uses an iPhone every day, right? So, so people sort of feel comfortable, right, using different technology. So whatever we use, I think it's important for us to make sure that that's really accessible for our patients and, and that's a safe way for them to do that. Um, you know, similarly, um, with my other co-presenters, you know, we, we've put in uh, kiosks at some of our, 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 our locations so that uh, patients don't necessarily have to come to one of our brick and mortar uh, locations. They can actually just go to one of our other locations and access care that way. And so I think if anything, what, you know, the pandemic has taught us is that, you know, these traditional models of healthcare are no longer going to work, right? Showing up with a brick and mortar, we need something different. We really need to sort of think about how to, how to really sort of move beyond that. And this, this is really what, what, you know, healthcare disruption is all about. And, um, and this is where I think health, you know, FQHCs are really on the forefront of this. And we serve, uh, you know, 30 million uh, patients annually uh, for 1400 health centers all over the U.S. and U.S. territories. And, you know, they really are incubators of these ideas. Uh, you know, they really are people who are on the ground serving, um, you know, patients who are uh, in rural areas and maybe have access to broadband or even people in urban areas who have, you know, there could be a, even a, a, a challenge getting across, you know, Boston or these big cities, right, to get to an appointment and, and what it costs to get there. So, I, you know, I really think that, uh, you know, FQATs really are, are in a great position uh, to really sort of help kind of drive some of these technologies and really sort of uh, uh, move some of them forward. No, uh, that's great. FQATs truly are, are leading the way. And, I, you know, the the examples that uh, Jessica, Diego, Chris, that you've provided hopefully give uh, the audience a broad view of different things that you can be doing. You know, one just to add to it is, is we've seen some uh, practices in rural areas use telehealth, not necessarily for patients, but use telehealth for translation services for communities in which the language is a barrier uh, to providing care, and they can bridge that gap easily right there uh, within their practice. So multitude of ways of outreach and giving that personalized care, as, as you've mentioned. Um, you know, if we think about it, you know, it's fall, we're starting to look forward into the upcoming years. FQHTs are always pushing forward in advancing technology and healthcare. I'm interested to hear kind of to make substantial progress forward, right? Not, not today, not in the immediate day, but as we think of like 10 years from now and really achieving equitable healthcare. 
uh, for all. In your opinion, and we'll start with you, Chris, uh, what do you think needs to happen, right? And, and you know, across, across the community um, and uh, with, within your organization and so forth, what, what do you think we, we should all work to do to really bridge that gap going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think like there, there are so many aspects of this when I be begin to really think about like what opportunities are out there. Um, and I think some of this I, you know, touched on earlier, um, it really about um, some of these, the ways in which we could use data. And, you know, I think right now we're, 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 we're sort of entering this perfect storm, right, where we have this uh, poor access to uh, care, we have a shortage of healthcare providers, we have rising costs. And, you know, if we don't use te technology to really sort of address some of these areas, we're going to, you know, we're, we're basically going to be, uh, you know, in the situation where we just aren't able to provide care to, to, to folks. So I think we're, we're, at, we're, we're at a time where I think there's just a tremendous opportunity. And so, you know, I think it's really more about moving that direction of thinking about um, precision, what I keep calling kind of my idea of precision medicine. It's really about tailoring uh, healthcare to what individual person needs. That's using the data to really sort of drive and figure out what what's going to work for that particular person. Because those broad messages that we send out, um, you know, they sort of don't don't really hit home with everybody. So we really need to find that hook. We need to figure out what's going to work for people. We need to really be able to understand uh, some of those patterns and ways in which people utilize care um, and maybe drive them to you know a more appropriate uh, yeah, access point into entry point. Um, we really need to continue to explore these no wrong doors of care and whether that's, uh, you know, telehealth, whether that's uh, in person, whether that's a combination of them both, whether that's something new that we haven't even thought of yet at this point. Um, but I think there's, you know, these tremendous opportunities in, in, to engage, you know, patients and being more proactive in their care. Um, you know, one way, you know, we've been trying to really do this at Fenway too, is to not be a gatekeeper of information. And we've done some of that work around social determinants of health where, uh, you know, patients sort of express a need and we immediately respond to them with resources, right? Because we don't want to be that person that, you know, they have to wait to hear from us, right? They have to wait to hear from us to sort of get access to the resources. So I think we need to, you know, figure out ways to continue to engage patients in the care. And, um, you know, what are those tools? And I think some of them probably haven't been, you know, maybe even developed yet at this point. But I think it's it's really around that partnership of, of how we get everybody around the table uh, us as, you know, people who are doing technology as healthcare providers and the patients and just figure out like, what are we going to do? What can we do to sort of address some of these obstacles and barriers? Because I, I think we're, we're, we're at a point where uh, we're, we're re reaching that, that, that urgency. I, I couldn't agree with yeah. you more. The complexity of the system yeah. becomes and is getting harder and harder and harder and the, and the burden is certainly there. I just a similar question, you know, same, same question to you is, uh, when you think of in North Country community you serve um, and uh, what, what you guys are doing, if, if we want to make substantial progress collectively as a community, uh, what do you think we need to do in the next you know, 10, 10, 20 years? Well, I really agree with what, what Chris said in terms of using the data that we have and hopefully expanding access to data to um, really determine how we can serve the whole population and whole person um, and tailor our outreach engagement services um, to ways that best serve patients and, and in a way that they, they need care um, at the time that they need care. Um, I think for us, it's a lot about collaboration with our community providers, our community-based organizations to ensure that we um, are not the only place that patients can go for services, but that we're collaborating with community providers um, on issues like transportation, housing, and food insecurity um, to make sure that patients have multiple avenues for care and that we are um, physically located or virtually located in places where, um, you know, patients don't need to come into our office to see us, but, um, you know, they may be able to see us out and about in the community. So um, having boots on the ground, meeting with patients where they are, whether that be the laundromat, their own home, um, or our sites, um, and then using data to really inform who those patients are and, and the ways that we can, can serve them best. Wonderful. And Diego, anything anything to add to that? Or um, well, no, I think I can echo that uh, we have to do a better job at engaging the communities. Right? We have data that tells us what communities are suffering from those those gaps, and they would benefit from from technology the best way possible. Um, and and so that that's 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 the key part of it uh, to try to also 
start empowering the communities. Um, and um, as a patient center medical home, we provide you know scorecards across the different locations so that patients can see where they who's doing better at right who does better at, at screening at performing certain things but we we lack that component of educating them to understand that their community is suffering from a disparity right an inequity uh, that they are suffering from hypertension from HIV so that's something that that um, that that we need to take into account if we want to if we want to move technology to address the needs of the patient population, because that population is the one that lacks the capability of understanding data. They, they lack the ability to understand that, you know, a cell phone, just like they use it for Facebook, can be used to contact a provider, right? Um, and one of the one of the the the, the coolest things I've seen uh, that would help a lot. In those in that health inequality, is uh, behavioral intervention uh, that there are already apps like uh, Noom. There's this app Noom, and it's basically uh, cognitive interventions where they push the patient to take certain actions based on reward, right? And I think that uh, that that is something that we should be able to try to work around. Uh, when we develop apps and when we develop programs in the technology world so that we can uh, create that need to make changes in their in how they feed themselves, what they purchase, right? Uh, if you see those apps for games for kids, it tells the kid that if they make X amount of points, they will be rewarded with a better boogie or a better car or whatever it is, right? And I think that uh, I've seen it on the on the behavioral health side. Obviously, they got to pay a membership, they got to pay a fee. So the idea is that we, as a as a group, you know, uh, policymakers, insurance uh, uh, companies should should be able to push and support the care of the patients using technology and actually reimburse for those services. Right? I think that uh, what Jessica was saying is that. We should move away from just having patients having to see a provider to be able to get access to some sort of healthcare, right? Uh, we do it with PEP, right? With post exposure prophylaxis, we allow pharmacists to deliver the medication without being seen by a patient, right? The after pill, it's another example, right? So I think that we we got to start becoming, you know, uh, more adamant of giving access to patients on certain areas that would enhance better without creating a, an additional challenge because like Chris was saying, we lack providers, we like technology everywhere. So we got to allow them to be, to, to be able to roam for free and get access to those basic things that can enhance and uh, eliminate that inequality. Uh, uh, Miami, you get to have appointments at the ER and you see that it says uh, X hospital or private hospital has 15 minute wait time. But when you got to go to Jackson Memorial Hospital and if you're uninsured, you can be up to five hours waiting, right? And that's a big inequality and it could be just something basic. So I think we got to move away from that uh, uh, and increase the access in a more creative way. Uh, I don't think it's going to require a lot of uh, 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 expenditures. I think it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's more of us as providers letting it go and allow other individuals to intervene and support in certain areas that that would make it easier. That's really changing the paradigm. And, and Chris talked about this a little bit of, of really changing how we look at healthcare and bring it to the point of need uh, as much as possible and transitioning those new care models uh, that you know are being experimented, but how do we make it and really in, uh, enable it both from a policy a practice perspective uh, in giving patients the tools. I, I, that's wonderful. Chris, I, you, you uh, raise your hand, just want to let you add a comment to that. Yeah, I, yeah, I, you actually turned, to, so took, took the words out of my mouth. I wanted to sort of talk about the, the really the importance of, um, you know, this isn't, this isn't, technology is important, but it's really to have the policy and the science uh, behind that as well. Um, you know, and oftentimes where I've seen advancements happen, it's because, you know, the science and the policy and the technology are sort of moving together at the same rate, but oftentimes where I've seen 
you know, these challenges happen is when they're not, you know, when the science is advanced, but we don't have the technology to support the work or the policy is still lagging behind, right? To sort of, or the policy is putting in barriers, right? To, to prevent that from happening. And I think, you know, telehealth is a great example of that, right? So we had a relaxing of these, laws, right, uh, state legislator laws, right, you know, so you could practice across state lines and you're getting paid at a, a, a similar rate. But now those are all rolling back, right? And so now those those patients that we are sort of caring for who are outside of Massachusetts, we can't do that anymore um, unless we have providers who are licensed across state lines. So, so that, you know, for the last year and a half where people finally had access to, you know, culturally responsive care, they felt like they were in a safe, comfortable environment. We're now having to take that away from them, right? So, so and the technology is there and the science is there to prove that, but the policy is not. And so the only way that we're really going to sort of um, really tackle these uh, these issues around inequity is if we really have all three of those three pillars working together simultaneously. Yeah, and it's, you know, and, and talk about a great forum, like the this forum that EHI is bringing together of really tackling these problems and getting in a, together in a room and, and discussing them and bringing them forward uh, is, is a great forum. And we need more of them, uh, to your point. We just have uh, three minutes because I know we could continue going on. Chris, there is one question here from the audience uh, I, I do want to bring forward because it's very related to the, to the conversation we were just having. The, the question is, is in the past years, public libraries served as a safe space for underserved populations, as well as a public access point to the internet or related computer technologies. Do you know of any policy or initiatives that look into utilizing those resources for providing different points of access for telehealth or, or other forms of care um, or, or discussion points in that? It's really leveraging resources that we had uh, in, the, in the public forum. Yeah, and it, and it's and I think it's one of those areas that, that ex exactly gets at some of that di digital divide. And there is unfortunately no policy in place. And I think so much of this is dependent on um, you know each healthcare organization, right, or the communities that people live in. And so you know that's where where you really see those inequities and disparities come into play. Because if one community you know has has a library, not every community even has that, right? So if some, but if some have a library or even have computers that they make available, or even for that matter, have computers in a com computers in a a, a, a private space, right? I mean, these are, I think there are so many different pieces to this, but I, I think, you know, we just have to continue to be creative uh, in ways in which we could sort of make, you know, all, all of these tools accessible to people. There, there is definitely not a one size fits all, um, but I mean, I think the goal here is not to say like, this is the only way to do this, but think about all the different ways uh, really that in those entry points, as I keep kind of continue to say like that no wrong door approach, you know, how can we just continue to do this? and you know, I do think this is probably, it is probably a great way in which, you know, we could think about how, you know, support from the federal government can really think about, you know, making these access points or funding, you know, different, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, organizations or, or, or whatever that might be to sort of put these, put these tools or these pods out there for people to access. And that'll be the last question, Chad, if you want to wrap her up. Yeah, no, and uh, yeah, thank you for the, thank you for that, Catherine, and thanks, uh, many thanks to the entire panel uh, for the great insight. You know, if I was to summarize kind of what we heard uh, as, as much as I can, the, the combination of data and looking at data, how can we leverage it and look behind the corners of, of not just the data that we see, but the data we don't see and some of the errors that are there. Outreaching to patients in new ways, the personal approach that's there is going to uh, provide the best care for them and using technology as part of the solution that might be there with infrastructure. Um, and, and really thinking of 